do is to present to you a kind of uh, an overview once again of the kinds of things I said in 2001 to give you a refresher on the electric universe model that I'm proposing and then to talk about how that might fit with the kinds of things that have been uncovered by the comparative mythologists in the US, Dwight Cardona, Dave Talbot, F. Cochran and others. And it's of course just my view and it seems to make sense to me but it may not make sense to you and I'm quite happy to discuss uh, the sense or the nonsense uh, after I've uh, spoken. This slide I used to open the uh, conference uh, presentation in Amsterdam. I tried to gauge the audience's reaction to it. I said, you know, does this send a shiver up your spine when you look at it? Because in this picture, Mars is about 100 times closer to the Earth than its present closest approach at about 15 million miles. The uh, image is superimposed with plenty of lightning and so on at the Kitt Peak Observatory. And of course with that well-known quote, <coughs> this is the book or the first book in a series uh, which is available on our website thunderbolts.info and uh, it's the first few chapters of a series, the second in the series will be the electric universe but this one is a kind of introduction and it also features uh, some of the work of Tony Peratt who I'm very pleased to uh, say is in the audience and will be speaking after me. Both David Talbot and myself got our inspiration initially from Emanuel Velikovsky who threw down the challenge to science of the day by proposing that electromagnetism had a role to play in the dynamics of the solar system. Of course we all know what happened. It was many years later that uh, I finally came to the big picture view if you like that electricity is at the heart of everything. In other words all matter is made up of charged particles and that their interactions at all scales is what gives the complexity and the, the wonders of the universe that we observe. The idea is, and this is rather heretical, this is supposed to represent a hydrogen atom with the nucleus uh, appropriately placed here and the electron shown to have structure. In other words, an electron is not a fundamental particle, it is a composite particle made up of subunits of charge. Now this idea came from Ralph Sansbury who has been to some of our meetings uh, and who I'd like to see along again. One of the requirements of this model is that these electrical particles are able to communicate at near infinite speed otherwise you cannot form stable systems of particles. You cannot form stable electrons, protons, neutrons, in other words we wouldn't have the universe we see today. But of course if you talk about communication at near infinite speed you then have to worry about Einstein and the things that are believed as a result of his work and in fact you have to give Einstein's uh, theories or his interpretations of the mathematics a miss and uh, look at it all again. Of course this kind of communication between these subparticles within normal matter has meaning for biology too because it means that every complex system of atoms will have a kind of a resonance about them which is communicated to nearby and even distant molecules of the same configuration. So in other words you get start to see how the mind-body connection might work and you get the impression also that the idea that nerves carry the signals around the body about what is going on in the environment is totally inadequate. I mean nerve signals travel at speeds measured in metres a second. If we have all of the mind and the body connected at near infinite speed we begin to understand how the amazing complexity of uh, consciousness and so on may work. When we go from that level we go up to space and we're looking at the interaction of charged particles in plasma. And this of course is Tony's area of expertise and uh, we'll hear about some of the amazing formations that uh, plasma can adopt. So that's a very quick vision of how it works at the most fundamental level. In the big picture approach of course there are many aspects which have to be plugged in and fitted like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So it embraces plasma cosmology because I think that's the most complete description of what's going on in space. 
it embraces Halton Arp's discovery of the birth of uh, galaxies in the form of quasars from the centres of active galaxies. This electro electrical model of matter, the structure of matter, also explains gravity and magnetism because if you have these charged particles in an electric field, they will be distorted and form tiny electric dipoles. One form of the dipole at the atomic level creates magnetism. Gravity is the distortion of the subatomic particles themselves, the electron, the proton, the neutron. That explains why gravity is such a weak force because the distortion of these subatomic particles is absolutely minuscule. Quantum weirdness now has an explanation. Instead of using probabilistic mathematics to describe what goes on in the world, it's, and I'm reminded of Douglas Adams with his infinite improbability drive. <coughs> you know, with that kind of mathematics and f underneath your physics, it means that almost anything can be said and explained away as being, well, you know, there's a finite probability that it will occur. And I think that's hopeless physics. If you give this substructure to matter, you then have the possibility of explaining quantum effects, that is jumps from one energy level to another, as simply jumps from one resonant state to another. Of course, uh, they discard certain things along the way. If you take this view, genetic determinism goes away because we're in contact with something outside, beyond the body. It also, uh, the plasma physics view also shows us that we have a dramatic history of the Earth. It's nothing like what we believed before. And it seems to be offering a coherent big picture because all of the discoveries that keep pouring in almost on a daily and weekly basis have no trouble in fitting this model as far as I can see. And uh, I'm also encouraged by others who look at this theory and then look at the news reports and come to me and say, well, you know, it makes sense. We come to plasma. On the screen there you see the simple plasma ball demonstration which you've seen in novelty shops and museums and you can see there that the electric discharge in the plasma takes a filamentary form and if you look at the ends of the filaments you can also see that they seem to be twisted pairs of filaments <coughs> and this is important well plasma physics and plasma cosmology in my view are extremely important because plasma comprises well almost 100 percent of the visible universe now we live at the bottom of an ocean of atmosphere where we don't have to deal with plasma on a daily basis, although occasionally you get an electrostatic shock when you get out of the car and grab the handle and that kind of thing. But in space, the charged particles do tend to be separate and form this plasma, which then, unlike any solid liquid or gas, which we're familiar with, it is conductive like a metal. It forms these filaments and bubbles and sheaths and has a magnetic field associated with it, generally if it's moving. Also, it can be recognised in space, even though it may be invisible to the, teles the visible uh, spectrum telescopes. It produces prodigious electromagnetic radiation over large parts of the spectrum, which means that it can be detected by radio telescopes and in intense examples by X-ray and gamma ray telescopes. You can almost see why we've gotten to this predicament of not recognising the importance of plasma effects in space uh, by the fact that we've grown up in this electrically, effectively neutral environment. But that's no reason to continue this way. Once we dis discovered plasma in space, <coughs> then we should have been looking at electrical effects in plasma to help explain strange objects like this, the centre of the Crab Nebula. Now that has all of the characteristics of a homopolar or a Faraday disk motor or generator. In other words, you have current moving along the axis and also in the plane of this disk. And we see this formation almost everywhere we look. Now I sat in on the lectures, I didn't do the exam because I figured it was a waste of my time. But I sat through all of the lectures of the postgraduate astrophysics course at the uh, University of London. And uh, at the end of the semester where we did plasma physics, I went to the lecturer and said, uh, when do we cover the subject of electric discharges in plasma? And he said, we don't do that. And I said to him, I think you're missing one of the most important aspects of cosmology. And he sort of turned on his heel and <laughs> who are you? 
So astrophysicists aren't taught this, this subject. It's really in the realm of electrical engineering and the extreme end of electrical engineering, I think, as Tony will, uh, would say. But it means that, in my view, the cosmology of the future will be open to the backyard tinkerer because you can actually get out in the garage and provided you do a little bit of electrical engineering, you can wire up uh, high energy devices to create discharges and see what happens. Uh, you can uh, use an arc welder to scar surfaces and then have a look at it under the microscope of what goes on and then relate that to things that are being seen in deep space. Astronomers are not doing this. I talked about the twin filament or filament pairs that uh, Berkel and Currents, named after one of the pioneers of um, the electrical nature of the Earth and the solar system. And electricity tends to flow through plasma along magnetic field lines. So it's able, you're able to trace magnetic fields in space wherever the plasma is radiating uh, and it can be seen. So this double helix kind of uh, arrangement can be seen in ejection of material from the sun, for instance. Of course, the astronomers say that it's magnetic effects that cause that. It's nothing to do with electric discharge. I was at a meeting of the National University where the director of the School of Astrophysics admitted that when we don't understand something, we blame it on magnetism. They were her exact words. <laughs> As if magnetism did by magic. Now, we've already discovered these planetary Berkeley currents. Back in the 80s, there was an article in New Scientist which was headed, Soho Catches Venus by the Tail. Now this is a distance of 45 million kilometres between Venus and the Earth and uh, the spacecraft here, SOHO, discovered these strange stringy things and uh, there was no explanation for that because it was felt that plasma from the tail of Venus would just blow and disperse like smoke in a wind. Instead of that they found that it was kept into these very well collimated stringy things and that's exactly what you'd expect of an electric current flowing from Venus away from the Sun and impinging on the Earth. And this is important in how we achieve stability. I'll talk about that later. This is uh, a very simple device which Tony knows quite a bit about. Um, it's called the plasma gun and all it is is uh, two uh, cylinders of metal with an insulator between and a source of high energy, uh, electrical energy. What you do is you fill a room with capacitors, charge them up and then you have a special switch which you then throw and the discharge begins at this end of these two cylinders and moves down this way. That's what this represents, the front of the discharge. When it gets to the end it sort of balloons out of the end and then collapses back into the centre of the inner tube and forms a tiny donut. And all of the energy stored in that huge array of capacitors is concentrated in a little donut about half a millimetre across. Now the electrons in that eventually get tangled up and the thing decays, but as it decays it fires this intense beam of x-rays and particles along the axis. Now this is a way of showing what happens when you concentrate electrical energy from a uh, dispersed source down to a compact source. And in the universe today we see repeatedly evidence of very compact sources of high energy uh, radiation and it's blamed on things like black holes, neutron stars and uh, strange things going on in the centres of active galaxies. All it is is a concentration of electrical energy. This is looking down the barrel of the plasma gun showing the Birkeland pair filaments radiating out from between the two electrodes and this is the plasmoid where the energy is collapsed in it's only half a millimetre across in this uh, particular experiment. We look out into space and here's, this is looking down the barrel of uh, a planetary nebula. Now Charles Bruce, the uh, English electrical engineer and fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, picked these as being an electric discharge phenomenon back in the 60s I think it was, or maybe even earlier. Here we have a very good comparison of this plasma gun effect with something that's seen in space on a much grander scale. 
Now here's a stellar scale plasma gun and can you imagine a jet like that extending from our star to three times the distance of Alpha Centauri but this is this is what you've got. I've been to many meetings of the uh, astrophysics department at the National University where they're spending an enormous amount of time and money trying to model these jets and explain how they punch their way out and still maintain that uh, very fine collimation and they haven't succeeded. But this is just a natural form of this plasma gun discharge effect. On the galactic scale we see the same kind of thing. This is the uh, wider image of the center of an active galaxy and this is the close-up and you can see the plasmoid and the, the same thing as we saw with the Crab Nebula, only this is on a galactic scale. We don't need black holes, it's just a simple electric discharge effect in plasma. The jets on this stretch for 5,000 light years, so it gives you some idea of the scale. And this is another important feature of plasma effects. They can be scaled from something in the laboratory which may be only millimetres or centimetres in size up to 5,000 light years. And one of the most important things to realise with all of this is that in plasma cosmology, the energy that we see concentrated in a very small spot in the centre of a galaxy or where there's supposed to be a black hole or a neutron star doesn't have to originate at that spot. The energy can be transferred over large distances invisibly just the way we do with these uh, big transmission towers on Earth. So the, the, the generating station may be thousands of light years away from where the energy is actually being uh, dissipated. This brings us to the question Ralph Jurgens raised back in uh, 1972. He said uh, very boldly in his first article that when you look at the Sun not one of the, the strange things that we see at the surface of the Sun and above in the atmosphere of the Sun has any right to be there if it is simply a self-gravitating ball which is trying to radiate energy into space. So the question is are we right in ascribing the old campfire in the sky type of uh, model to the Sun only this time we're using a thermonuclear reactor as your heating source or is it some kind of giant ball of lightning if it is the centre of a discharge? Sir Arthur Eddington uh, is the guy we can thank for the standard model of the interiors of stars and he was sufficiently arrogant to say that, that well, the Sun is a simple thing, we should be easily able to describe it. But of course you may be able to describe it in terms of a particular model and his model was one using standard gas laws and uh, Newton's law of gravity and so on and then uh, using that to try and create a situation in which nuclear reactions would take place. But if that model is incorrect, all the mathematics in the world, and I went through blackboard after blackboard after blackboard at the University of London uh, talking about the standard model of stars, if the initial model is incorrect then all of that mathematics is worthless. In fact he calculated that using the simple gas laws, because an electron is much lighter than hydrogen, the hydrogen atom, that based on the gas laws electrons would tend to float to the top, uh, which is when you think of it an extremely simplistic way to look at it and that you would only have one electron per million tonnes of uh, solar matter separated. In other words, you could forget it, forget electricity. And that was it. That was, that was the end of an electrical sun. Mm -hmm. He was also an uncritical champion of Einstein, but I won't go into that here. Now, sunspots are an enigma in terms of the standard model of the sun. Now, if the sun is just trying to radiate energy from within, and it's tens of millions of degrees near the core of the Sun. What are these dark spots on the surface? If we're looking beneath the surface, that should be brighter if heat is just trying to get out from underneath. The simplest answer, of course, is that the Sun is thousands of degrees cooler inside. And what we see there is precisely how the Sun is uh, through maybe to the centre. Now, look at the structure there too. This is what's known as the penumbra or the, uh, its diminished brightness of the sun around the dark sunspot. But that filamentary pattern it has nothing to do with convection and yet all of this, the uh, raising of heat from the centre of the sun to the outside is supposed to be due to turbulent convection. This is not turbulent. These filaments last for 
minutes or hours in some cases and then just fade away and are replaced by another one. So their, their behaviour is nothing like uh, we would expect from a, a wildly boiling pot of uh, gas or fluid. And then just a short time ago, uh, some of the sharpest photographs ever taken of a sunspot were published. And the puzzle for the uh, physicist was this kind of thing here. If you look at these filaments closely, this is just two of these filaments here, only they're called the light bridge because they actually go across from one side of the sunspot to the other. You'll notice they have dark cores. And that has no meaning whatsoever in convection. However, I managed to find on the web a photograph taken of a, a tornado of fire which was done by a special effects team in the US. And what they did was they had a, an aircraft engine up here to create a vortex and they fed fuel in at the bottom, uh, vaporised fuel, and fired it. And of course what you see is the dark core and the bright edges, which is precisely the analogue of what we see there. When I first thought about the sun being a giant ball of lightning, I thought, well, we should be able to scale. You know, plasma effects should be scalable. And when I did the calculations, it seemed that lightning wasn't the explanation because lightning is too brief and it is too small. It wouldn't be resolved, even in a photograph like this, if it was just lightning bolts. And it dawned on me that this is another form of lightning discharge in the Earth's atmosphere where the discharge is constrained to last longer because it is tightly bound by a very powerful electromagnetic field and so it's an electric tornado. Also when you scale up the duration and the size of tornadoes to that we see on the Sun, the actual time that it lasts matches and also the size scales up. So the Sun is covered with electric tornadoes which is a form of discharge which is slower and more measured than uh, just lightning strikes. So that was a bit of a revelation for me. Whenever you get into arguments on the web about the Sun, the model that's in the mind of those who are arguing against you is this one, this plain old electrostatic model, where the Sun is a positively charged body and uh, the planets have an induced field on them and uh, also any charged particles within the range of the electric field of the Sun will accelerate to relativistic velocities and hurtle towards the Sun. And the argument is we should see these relativistic electrons streaming towards the Sun. And the answer is it's the wrong model. Zero out of ten for that. <coughs> what you've got to do if you're going to argue this case is to look at the real model, electrical model, that Ralph Jurgens proposed. And he proposed that the Sun is the centre of a glow discharge. These are examples, if you, did, uh, if you played around in the physics lab you would have seen these in high school where they had the evacuated tube and the vibrator um, magneto coil type arrangement to provide high voltage. And the pattern of light and dark in the tube changed depending on the pressure and the voltage. This is an example here where you end up with uh, stacked columns of light in that discharge. Now, it's quite complex what goes on in a discharge tube and uh, Ralph Jurgens chose a particular explanation for how the solar system was situated in terms of that glow discharge and for a long time I agreed with him until I looked at the behaviour of comets and so on and I realised that uh, it, it didn't really match. This is a picture of the solar system, this is from the standard work. It shows you the position of Voyager 1 and Pioneer 11 and Voyager 2 as they head out to what they think is the boundary of the Sun's heliosphere or where the solar wind meets the galactic environment. And it's all talked about in terms of shock waves and fluid dynamics. In the electrical model, what we're looking at here is a, a plasma sheath where the electrical nature of the Sun meets the electrical nature of the uh, surrounding galactic plasma. And wherever there's a difference, plasma forms a sheath. And this has some specific meanings in terms of the gas discharge. 
what I've done here is to line up this gas discharge tube with the solar system to give you some idea of what's going on. The sun is the most positive object in the solar system. It is positively charged with respect to the galaxy and therefore it accepts electrons uh, to provide the electrical energy for it. But it does this in a, in a way which is rather interesting. One of the puzzles about the spacecraft that are leaving the solar system is that they have been experiencing a force that's tugging them back towards the sun and it's a constant force. Now this is strange because there is no force, uh, the force of gravity and uh, the electric force and the magnetic force all decrease with distance apart between the charges or the objects that are magnetized. In this case the tug backwards towards the sun has been constant and that can be explained only by this model in my view and that is because you'll notice that the voltage gradient over most of the distance from the sun to this boundary here is constant which means that a charged spacecraft and all spacecraft become charged once they're launched into space charged negatively uh, it means that they're being tugged back electrically by this constant voltage gradient and I think that's a crucial a crucial point to make. At present there is no explanation for these decelerations. It also has great meaning in terms of the Saturn configuration which I'm about to come to. So this interplanetary space is the positive column region. It's almost like it's in the gas discharge tube it's like this part here is the copper wire that transfers current from one end to the other. And we all know that in copper wire if it's carrying a current, the electrons actually move very slowly indeed. It's at a speed measured in centimetres per hour rather than anything like light speed. So we can expect in this region here you won't find relativistic electrons, you will find a drift of electrons towards the sun. And it'll be hard to measure except by things like the magnetic field associated with that drift. Another point about the Saturn configuration is it talks about the Earth existing with a prior star or prior sun to the one we've got now, which is pretty mind-boggling when you first come across this idea. But we have plenty of evidence that stellar evolution doesn't occur according to the old recipe book of uh, nuclear burning of hydrogen and uh, helium and carbon and so on and get down this chain. Here's a star which has changed over a period of months and there are plenty of examples of this. So a star is a child of its environment. If the electrical environment changes, if it were to change on our sun, it could come up tomorrow morning as a red giant or as a white dwarf, which is a bit of a scary thought. <laughs> However, we have some reassurance by looking at the stars in our vicinity to see whether they're behaving badly. If, if they were, then I would be concerned, but they don't seem to be. All models that look at life in the universe use the Earth as the prime example. In doing so, they make a huge mistake in my opinion because in my view, the Earth's position right now is rather precarious and it's not its original situation. Uh, so that people like uh, Ross Taylor, who I have great respect for, and he spent his life trying to figure out how the solar system was formed and how you might look for life in the uh, universe, came up with this this conclusion. And I think this conclusion is a good indication that we've got the wrong idea about where life is formed. And it also shows we have the wrong idea about <coughs> how the solar system was formed. Now a few years back it, it dawned on me after reading an article about Betelgeuse, uh, the red giant, which is depicted here as that red glow, and it was pointed out that the solar system out to the orbit of Jupiter would fit within Betelgeuse and that uh, the planets would happily continue orbiting within Betelgeuse because it is such a rarefied environment. But when you think about it, we're orbiting in the sun's atmosphere right now, so it's a similar kind of thing. The difference is that for planets, if you had this hypothetical situation, planets orbiting in that within the star and also provided you don't subscribe to the thermonuclear model of a star where the energy is coming from here but the energy is coming from outside this shell provides equal energy over every body, every square inch of every body in that uh, environment so it doesn't matter what your axial tilt is, your orbital spin, your daily spin rate 
anything, eccentricity, the energy you receive on every square inch of every planet in that situation will be the same. And I think that's the most hospitable place in the universe for life to form because not only is this uh, even distribution of energy conducive to life, but also we know from looking at red dwarfs and so on that the compounds in this atmosphere are the ones we need for life. They're carbon compounds, they're water, nitrogen-based compounds and so on. So in my opinion that's where life is nurtured. I was very interested in Dwight Cardona's work on the ancient memories of how the sky appeared to um, ancient man and they talk there about the purple dawn of creation and that the light in the sky was different. And that fits with that red dwarf model. In other words, when we talk about dwarf, you forget about the dwarf size. No one's actually ever measured the diameter of these red dwarfs. All it means is they're a very cool star and therefore it's assumed they're very small. In my opinion, they will be, in effect, the same thing as a red giant, but at a lower temperature. Dwight Cardona um, came up with a scenario which I, I use as a basis for trying to figure out how this might have happened. And it points to the electrical capture of a stellar system of which we were a part, along with Mars and Venus, uh, in, in the beginning, if you like, in the beginning of uh, recorded history, or at least remembered history. And I think that this electrical capture scenario may explain the formation of this polar configuration. Now, I must say here that Dwadu uh, has evidence, he feels, for this polar configuration having existed over a vast span of time. And I haven't yet figured out how that might be so. All I can tell you about is what I think happened if we were captured by the sun <coughs> and the evidence for that. What I'm suggesting is that if this were the sun and here we see the heliosphere, if you like, and its cometary appearance made visible, but if you assume that, uh, as it is today, that it was invisible, we then have another red dwarf star approaching and at some point the two um, stellar plasma sheaths will intersect and when that happens they both for the first time see each other electrically. Now the Sun is a brighter star than what I call proto-Saturn because uh, these objects have been identified as a stellar form of the planet Saturn before it entered the Sun's environment. Uh, these stellar um, plasma sheaths are huge. The one for the Sun is estimated somewhere around 100 astronomical units wide, which means that the cross-section for capture is actually much larger than you would expect on a gravitational uh, model. Now, the electrical effects on proto-Saturn will be profound because in the galactic environment it was a star therefore it was positively charged with respect to its environment it accepted energy like any other star. The Sun by comparison is much more strongly positively charged so when Saturn reaches this environment suddenly it is negatively charged with respect to the Sun and the result is that this becomes a cathode discharge phenomenon which is quite different to an anode discharge. And one of the, th the things that happens with the cathode is that uh, material is machined off it and torn off. And it appears this is what happened and I believe uh, it would explain the birth of Venus in the recent past. Now, why did it form a polar configuration? My view is that when this object entered the Sun's environment, it also experienced this same accelerating force that the Voyager and the Pioneer spacecraft have uh, discovered. And that is, it'll be a steady acceleration towards the Sun. Because it's constant like that, it means that you can have a dynamic equilibrium between the force of gravity of the uh, orbiting satellites of this body and the electrical force tending to pull proto-Saturn out of the centre of it. And that, in my view, is what would give a, a kind of comet Shoemaker-Levy uh, disruption of the proto-Saturnian system. So these little yellow dots here are meant to represent 
the planets which would go from a equatorial orbit to be pulled out into a polar string if you like and the only way they can work is if this force from the sun is fairly constant uh, David Talbot uh, has amassed evidence which shows that Mars moved up and down between Venus if you imagine uh, Mars being this body here and that's the Earth and this is Venus Mars moved up and down between Venus and the Earth and this is the kind of thing you would expect if Mars accepted charge from Venus which would then force it down towards the Earth where it dumped charge on the Earth it would move back up the column so it would oscillate between the two bodies so that may give an explanation for that kind of uh, activity as well so this is what I'm suggesting is that we had a kind of dynamic equilibrium between gravity and the electrical acceleration uh, caused by the Sun's environment and uh, Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 of course was heavily influenced by the solar environment rather than Jupiter's uh, while it was in this while it was photographed in this position so the cometary tails were all pointing away from the Sun in the case of Proto-Saturn the cometary tail would have enveloped the planets as well and that I think was the core of the plasma discharge which Tony has um, uh, described in his article in the IEEE journal mm -hmm. as an auroral type display well it would certainly have been an auroral type display but of uh, immense power because here we would be caught up directly in the stellar discharge of Saturn what evidence do we have to suggest that this really way out scenario might be correct well one of the best bits of evidence in my view is the fact that any rotating body is in effect a gyroscope and the direction of the axis tends to remain fixed in inertial space which means that as with all the giant planets their satellites tend to orbit in the equatorial plane and always showing the same face towards the central body that means that the axes of rotation will all be lined up now if Saturn was pulled away from its satellites and those satellites were Mars, Earth and Venus you would expect that the axes would still remain pretty well lined up and what we find today is that um, Mars, Earth and Saturn have the most closely uh, similar axial tilts it means also that we can look at other bodies in the solar system and look for similarities here and we may be able to determine some kind of genealogy in the future which will allow us to say this body was related to that one there and then go and uh, examine that as a possibility with further uh, visits by spacecraft Venus of course is different and you've got to ask why that might be so at present today it rotates very slowly backwards if you like and also its axial tilt is fairly low with respect to the Sun the thing is that as I said when proto-Saturn as a small star entered the Sun's environment it began ejecting material they would tend to do that from the equatorial regions where the spin velocity is greatest and also as that material is spun off as Eric Crew many years ago pointed out the body once spun off will tend to be like a pair of gears so it will tend to rotate retrogradely with respect to its parent it's like if you like it's given a kick in the backside and it tends to spin backwards also at the time when Venus was born Saturn was suffering accelerations which would have taken it taken Venus out of the equatorial orbit so that it would have had um, tidal forces on it which would tend to be give it a axial tilt different to Mars and Earth all of these things we find so I think that uh, as a first cut at an explanation for this strange polar configuration this one seems to uh, meet most of the objections I've seen in the past one of the th problems with gravitational physics Newton's form of gravity is that it's known by celestial dynamicists that if you have more than two bodies in orbit about each other they will the system will be unstable and will fly apart it will become chaotic and the question comes about then how do you form a gravitationally stable system of planets why is the solar system today apparently in a stable configuration 
This is one of the big objections initially to Velikovsky's idea that Mars and Venus were within the memory of man, seen up close and personal. The answer is that you need two forces in acting to be able to form a stable system. And it seems that the interaction electrically between planetary bodies in the solar system and between the planetary bodies and the sun is essential to uh, form this stability. In other words, if one planet tends to move outwards, and forget about the fact that this is a well, clockwork <laughs> solar system, if one body moves out towards the orbit of another, then when they're in uh, conjunction or when, when they're closest together in their orbits, the uh, transfer of electrical energy takes place like you saw in that early slide of Venus where the electric currents from Venus actually do touch the Earth. The closer they approach, the more intense that discharge will become. The effect is, if we assume along with Ralph Sansbury that gravity is an electrical effect, then the degree of charge polarization within a body determines the actual measured mass or gravity of that body. So you have a very effective means for shifting the two bodies apart, shifting their orbits apart again. Because if you transfer charge from one to the other, the effect is to move this planet out and this one in when they come close to, to one another. And that is a very rapid way of uh, achieving stability. The other thing is if you're on a very eccentric orbit, you do what a comet does, you discharge all the time to the environment. And we know for a fact that comets suffer what are known as non-gravitational forces without specifying precisely what those non-gravitational forces might be. I would suggest that they are gravitational forces, it's just that we don't understand gravity. So it is possible in my view in this electrical model to achieve orbital stability rapidly. And it also helps to account for how the human race might have survived having been torn from a prior stellar system and ending up in a new stellar system. How we had the luck to land in a spot where life could go on is another question entirely. One of the other things that has in intrigued me is the origin of planetary atmospheres. Because the Earth's atmosphere is anomalous, uh, Venus's atmosphere is strange. If Venus had anything to do, if it was ever a twin of the Earth's, their atmospheres certainly aren't. And recently, of course, we've had a look at uh, Titan and its atmosphere. And so the question arose in my mind is why are they so different and why do some objects have very dense atmospheres and some have almost none, like Mars for instance. And it can't just be to do with their size because Titan is an object which is much smaller than Mars yet it has an atmosphere which is heavier than the Earth's. If we accept that Saturn was a star in the past of the form that I mentioned where the Earth, Mars and various other bodies orbited within that uh, glowing sheath, then they all would have received the same kinds of uh, chemicals, you know, nitrogen, oxygen and so on in their atmospheres and also water vapour. And the question is why are they so different today? Well, what I'd suggest is uh, that we need to look at the work of the French uh, chemist Louis Curvran who was nominated for the Nobel Prize before, unfortunately he died before it was taken any further. But he showed with a series of simple experiments that even biological systems, enzymes, are capable of transmuting elements. We've been brought up to believe that you can only transmute elements in atom smashes and in uh, nuclear bombs and so on. But if you think about the, what I was talking earlier, the electrical structure of matter, it seems fairly evident that if you can use resonant catalysts, that is something which resonates at the frequencies of the uh, constituents of an atom, then you can actually perform minor miracles. And biology does that all the time it seems, because Louis Curvran showed that it is possible to transmute elements uh, in gram amounts in simple biological systems, like for instance the chicken's egg and he's done this or shown this experiment and described it for school kids to do where you take 
uh, two eggs, one fertilised and one unfertilised, and you let the fertilised egg develop to the point where the chicken is about to hatch, and then you take the two eggs and measure the amount of calcium and silica in the two, and you find that in the fertilised egg, the silica has plummeted and the calcium has risen by a commensurate amount. So something is going on inside that fertilised egg which is converting silica into calcium. Now, one of the early puzzles he was asked to perform by the French government was to find out why welders were suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. And yet, as far as they could tell, there was no carbon monoxide in the atmosphere. He, with his open-minded approach to nuclear transformations, went along and measured the atmosphere and sure enough there was no carbon monoxide in the atmosphere being breathed by these welders and yet they had a very high level of carbon monoxide, even to lethal levels, inside in their blood. And he figured out that what was going on was that the nitrogen was being heated on the red hot iron surfaces was being activated in some sense, in other words it was a resonant system which was being bumped up a level or two in resonant state and when breathed in and landing on the substrate of the lung surface the lung surface was mediating the transformation of that nitrogen molecule into carbon monoxide and that was the only sensible explanation that uh, was arrived at and he was able then to go on later and show how these resonances work so I think in the future his work will be crucial to understanding planetary atmospheres. And the reason I say that is because Venus is a classic example, I think, where nitrogen has been converted to carbon monoxide on a planet-wide scale over thousands of years to the extent now that its atmosphere uh, almost completely lacks water. <clears throat> it is very high in carbon monoxide and the only other trace gas there is nitrogen uh, of any significance. When the, uh, uh, the landing craft landed on Venus and they descended through the atmosphere, <coughs> they measured in particular the constituents in the atmosphere and they discovered to their amazement that water vapour was present in the upper atmosphere but decreased in concentration the closer they got to the surface. My explanation for that would be this. The surface of Venus is about 900 degrees Fahrenheit or so, so it is in effect a red hot surface. It is perfectly capable of activating the nitrogen molecule to this raised level of energy. Also we know that the, or at least in my view, the surface of Venus is discharging continually in a form of St Elmo's fire from the surface, so there is electrical energy available too. We have the fact that the other major constituent, apart from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is nitrogen, uh, but it seems to have been almost all consumed. The fact that water is disappearing at the surface means that it also is being consumed, and there's a very simple reaction that was used uh, for many years in gas production. And what they do there is combine the um, water vapour at high temperature with carbon monoxide to form carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The hydrogen in this case is lost to space and we know that there uh, was vast amounts of hydrogen uh, being dispersed into space by Venus. The carbon dioxide, the heavy carbon dioxide atmosphere then can all be explained in terms of an original heavy nitrogen atmosphere, electrical activity and high temperature of Venus. Now if we go to Titan, Titan is the other huge puzzle as far as atmosphere is concerned and it is importantly a major, the major satellite of Saturn. Its atmosphere has a high concentration of nitrogen. I would suggest that Titan is, the atmosphere of Titan is a uh, kind of a snapshot of what Venus's atmosphere was originally too. Because of this association between Venus, Mars, Earth, Saturn and Titan, I was able on my website to predict what would be found when the first spacecraft descended beneath the clouds on Titan and I was very gratified to have that confirmed when the electrical scarring on uh, Titan was shown in those first images. Uh, we published on the thunderbolts.info website almost immediately afterwards and I did a, a reverse image instead of uh, black on white, it was white on black turned it up so that it just looked like a lightning bolt and uh, <laughs> I think uh, that made the point. 
you don't need liquids to form those kinds of uh, discharge patterns on planetary surfaces. So all of these things tend to fit together. The Titan was a member of the family, that it has connections with uh, Venus. It also has connections with Mars because Mars has a, a whiff of Venus's atmosphere about it with the carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide locked up in the polar caps, the nitrogen and uh, also Titan has the carbon or the methane which has been discovered there and the same on Mars and both of those are great puzzles because methane cannot last over geological periods of time. It has to be either produced or it's the remainder of a more copious source in the recent past. So these things at the level of the atmosphere seem to fit together as well. And it is a, a model which is predictive, so I'm able to make predictions which I feel fairly confident about, like the one about Titan. Now, I've covered such a, a lot of ground and very quickly, and I know we have uh, time for questions. And I'd just love to have questions because that way I learn something as well from these meetings. So, I open the floor to questions if that's okay. That's good. Thank you very much. Okay. You mentioned um, the plasma gun created in the laboratory with a large amount of capacitance, which you then short circuit across the cylinders. <coughs> Where does the capacitance effect um, come from or exist in, in the manatory there? Or the yes, this gets back to the question of where is the power source? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, uh, I don't know whether Tony may have a view on this, but. Uh, Alton Knapp's picture of the universe is that what we see is only a very small part of something which is of unknown extent and of unknown age. Uh, so we don't know what's going on beyond our little backyard, so to speak. All we can do is detect the fact that there are huge burgling currents uh, threading the galaxies that we see in the visible universe. And where they originate from, we don't know. But the other thing is that uh, when you have plasmas of different uh, characteristics moving relative to one another, you must have electric currents as a result. So just the very fact of having a universe which is not homogeneous in plasma terms is, and it's got movement is sufficient to create these giant electric currents. But when you get back to the big questions of the beginnings, <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's anybody's guess. In fact, I think it's better to uh, state your ignorance rather than try and uh, work up some perfect uh, principle and then try and work forwards. It's better to look at what we can see and as far as we can work backwards with the information we have and get some idea of how we got to where we are now from some earlier point, but certainly not going back to the beginnings. From discharge of that uh, stored energy to focus it down into the donut, the plasmoid, yes. it is the same sort of sudden discharge applicable in space or is it yes. the fact that you've got yeah. In which case, where does the capacitance come from? What holds the two different positives and negatives apart to start with? Well, I think the answer is probably in uh, plasma double layers, where the electric field is strongest. In other words, where you get two plasmas of different characteristics, uh, where they come together, you will get a, a strong voltage difference. And it may be that uh, at some point that layer will break down, and then you get the most enormous out burst of power. And I think that most of the things that uh, astrophysicists currently point to as being examples of magnetic reconnections is actually this kind of uh, double layer release of energy in a very small volume. Uh, and that is, of course, another characteristic of 
with the, this kind of electrical activity is that uh, it is discontinuous, so that you can have a steady buildup over a period of time of electrical stored energy, uh, which is then suddenly released. And this, we see this all over the universe where there are uh, pulsars and uh, galactic centers discharging and so on and ejecting quasars. So uh, there's plenty of evidence of this discontinuous outpouring of energy. Yes, Tony. Yes, uh, you are absolutely right about the double layer playing the role of the uh, of the Marx bank, the uh, uh, capacitor bank that uh, uh, one uses in the dense plasma focus. And, and I congratulate you on that uh, on the uh, schematic of the of the uh, DPF, uh, the dense plasma focus, which um, uh, which I now use myself, and I feel free to to use it because it. it it, when one goes back to the history to the original penciled notes that I got from the great physicist, um, in, in my uh, opinion, Winston Bostick, uh, uh, it, it was very crudely drawn, and, and each time it was published, it occurs in my book again. It, it's, it, it's somewhat better, but yours is, uh, I don't know, correct? It's very good. Uh, what what we did uh, in, in in producing the uh, the uh, plasma uh, uh, penumbra or chalice that you showed was uh, to use a, a, a 300 kilojoule uh, Marx bank uh, which had about um, uh, 24 capacitors and uh, filled with uh, uh, with, uh, with transform oils about an eighth of a size of this uh, of this room and then discharged uh, in, uh, in, in microsecond time scales and, and then went through uh, various switches which uh, shortened up the uh, pulse to nanoseconds width. By the time it was fed to the, uh, to the cylindrical uh, anode cathode uh, assembly and at that point then the sheath is formed which, which then propagates down because of the electromagnetic force across the uh, propagates down the end of the tube and then forms the, the chalice, the uh, very beautiful chalice and, and or, or penumbra, if, if you wish to know. But getting back to the point, it, it, it is a double layer in space that occurs uh, wherever you have currents in space, which is, say, everywhere in, in the uh, plasma or electric universe uh, that plays this role of, of the Mars band. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Tony. Yes. Do you consider the rotation of cosmic bodies a driven function and uh, think that the slow rotation of Venus might be because of its recent birth? Yes, that, I'm sure that's the case. <clears throat> I think one of the things I didn't mention uh, is that those Birkeland currents uh, rotate around one another, so that is, I think, the origin of all rotation. The rotation of galaxies, the rotation of stars, and so on. I didn't actually point out something that just occurred to me. Uh, in this business of uh, the Sun and proto-Saturn approaching one another, it's interesting to note that uh, the Sun and our solar system sort of travels f flat on to the direction of the uh, galactic current that uh, drives us, if you like, uh, which I find interesting. And also proto-Saturn must have come in at an angle of about 26 degrees, either from above or below the plane. If it came from below, I would expect the uh, polar column to have appeared in the northern hemisphere. If, it, if the sun overtook proto-Saturn, I would expect the polar column to have appeared in the southern hemisphere. So, uh, you know, there are these issues to look at as well, but it all fits with this uh, plasma cosmology picture, I think. And I, I feel that that is fundamentally important. If we're going to explain this, plasma cosmology is at the heart of it, and then the electrical nature of stars is also the other main uh, uh, element that we have to incorporate to come up with a correct answer. I follow up a bit. If, if it's externally driven, is the Earth's magnetic field externally I think my, my view on that is, and I've puzzled about this uh, quite a lot, the notion that a charged rotating body will uh, create a dipolar magnetic field anyway is, is well known. Um, geologists dismissed this because they figured out how much current would be required to generate the Earth's magnetic field and they said, well that would require so much charge that the field at the Earth's surface would be millions of volts per metre. But that was assuming the standard electrostatic model. You remember the one I showed with the pith ball and so on? In the plasma uh, universe model, 
the Earth is enveloped in a plasma sheath, one of these double layers, and most of the voltage drop occurs at the boundary of this double layer. Within that, the voltage uh, drop is quite low, and it's this kind of 100 volts per meter we measure at the Earth's surface. It gives you an impression of uh, uh, the, the uh, scaling down of that uh, powerful electric field. So the Earth can be charged, in my opinion, sufficiently to create a large part of the Earth's magnetic field. But then there are a lot of other effects that impinge on that. There are currents, ring currents around the Earth, there are currents within the Earth, um, and there are also effects related to the tie-up between gravity and magnetism. You know, there is a there is a, a tie up there as well. So all of these th things combined give us a very complex uh, magnetic field. And it seems to me that changes in the Earth's magnetic field, like reversals and that, are a bit difficult to explain, except maybe by Peter Warlow's tippy top theory. You know, but there are so many things I still want to investigate. There's uh, Carey's expanding Earth theory and so on. I want to see how that fits. Uh, all sorts of things that uh, come into it. So. Even though I say these things as though I believe every word of what I'm saying, I'm still open to uh, objections and, uh, and better ideas. Um, you mentioned in the answer to two questions back that the electric current driving the sun came in perpendicular to the plane. Mm. How much big is the electric current driving the sun? What sort of sizes have been measured? Yes, I have. In fact, Tony, I think, might remember better than me, but I think it was something like 23 kiloparsecs or something is the size of one of these plasma tubes. That, something like that, I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote it down on my whiteboard at home and I, as an important number. Yeah. But it is huge compared to the sun. Oh, I see. Uh, by radio telescopes, I think, are the best way to measure the magnetic fields associated with these uh, huge currents. And I think uh, Jared is has done work on that, and it was from him that this uh, estimate came from. Uh, just an aside with that, um, this kind of structure in space, electrical structure, I think, helps to explain the uh, solar cycle, the sunspot cycle because the Earth, these currents are there rotating and they all, the Sun must also drift with respect to them as well. I beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, and so there will be a variation in the current and the orientation of the magnetic field on a quasi-cyclic uh, basis. And if sunspots and the electrical activity on the Sun is all driven by these uh, galactic Birkeland currents, then they must be the origin of these variations in the sun's output. Nothing to do with what goes on inside the sun. As far as I can tell, nothing <laughs> as much is going on inside the sun. Yes? Do you know in your model heavier molecules are created on the surface of the sun and they are in? Yes, yeah, heavier atoms actually because the uh, these discharges are sufficiently powerful to transmute elements and to uh, this plasma gun effect also is a copious produ producer of neutrons, and neutrons are the best way to build elements from up the scale, you know, to uh, the heavy elements. And we know from the uh, zodi zodiacal dust and uh, capture of material in space, interplanetary dust, that uh, most of the heavy elements are represented, and this is a puzzle to the present theory of how the sun works, where you would expect uh, far more hydrogen than the heavy elements. Also, the spectrum of the sun shows in the Fraunhofer lines uh, most of the heavy elements we find on Earth. That too is a bit of a puzzle unless they're being produced there. But I would expect they would uh, tend to settle into the centre of the sun. And that gets to the next step in a sun or in a star's life, and that is that uh, at some point it may decide to, for, due to some instability, electrical or mechanical, to remove some of the material from its centre. Uh, as Eric Crewe described many years ago by electrical parturition. In other words, you've got one lump of positively charged matter here and you've got the core of the star positively charged. The electrical force is then sufficient to eject matter rather like a, a massive coronal mass ejection, only this time with sufficient material to form a, a companion. And it's one way that Don Scott has pointed out that a star can actually relieve itself of electrical stress that it, it is finding difficult to handle. You, sp you split into two 
and then you increase the surface area and reduce the electric stress on both bodies, which may explain why you find so many stars that are binaries and triple star systems. There's no explanation for that in standard gravitational accretion theory. Does your model suggest that um, one planet can affect the rotational speed of another? Uh, yes, actually, because if you dump charge from one body to another, <coughs> you are effectively changing the moment of inertia of that body. In other words, the, the angular momentum, which means that you have to change the rotation rate to achieve or to uh, have co conservation of momentum. And it's known that if the sun deposits a large amount of charge on the Earth uh, in one of its outbursts, that there is a, what's called a glitch in the Earth's rotation, which is sudden, and then it gradually, exponentially goes back to its original uh, rotation rate, which fits the electrical model, but has no good explanation in uh, purely mechanical terms. One of the ideas was that, for instance, that the sun has an a ter terrific outburst, it heats the upper atmosphere, the upper atmosphere expands, that increases the, uh, you know, it's like the skater thing, you know, letting the arms out and spinning more slowly, and then gradually the arms come down and the earth speeds up again. But the effect was totally inadequate. But if you are dumping electric charge on the body, then that is changing the moment of inertia directly and almost instantaneously. And so you would expect this kind of effect. I don't know whether anyone's calculated the relative values, but um, Irving Michelson, the physicist who was associated with Velikovsky back in the um, 60s, put forward this idea. And I think it uh, has a lot of merit. So from our scale, would that be appreciable change? No, no, it's microseconds usually. It's very small. You can see it easily using atomic clocks, but. Um, it's not uh, something that we would notice. I'm just concerned about the movement of Mars and Venus within the polar configuration. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the movement of Mars and you explained that that didn't quite catch it. Oh. And is there, is there movement up and down at all with regard to Venus or is it static? I don't think it was static either uh, because it was discharging very strongly according to uh, the, the record. Was it, was it going up and down as well then? Probably to some degree, yes. They were all moving in that column because it was a dynamic stability but it was also affected by charge transfer between the bodies and yes. depending on whether that charge transfer was rapid or how effective it was then the bodies had to adjust their positions because their relative masses would appear to change or the gravitational force on them would appear to change and it's no good pointing at that but <laughs> um, at the top level you have Saturn the most positively charged body then you have Venus which was uh, in the scale of things at the next level of charge having just been born from Saturn and then Mars and then Earth and uh, because they were in a plasma discharge column, they could pass charge from one to another fairly effectively, uh, which meant that um, Mars then would act like an oscillating charge carrier. In other words, it would, as it approached, or Venus approached it, or it approached Venus, and the distance became small enough, then one of these cosmic thunderbolts of the gods would occur, which would uh, create a certain amount of devastation in the polar regions. Mars would then, with its new charge, exhibit a different level of uh, massiveness or gravitational attraction towards Saturn. The result was that uh, Mars dropped away from Venus. This is the avoidance mechanism, if you like, that creates orbital stability. Uh, but in doing so, it approached Earth, and then it discharged catastrophically to the Earth, and the Earth then would drop away from Mars, so that Mars would then appear to grow smaller in the sky, and it would move gradually back up the other way, because it had lost that charge that initially pushed it away from Venus. So it would be this sort of oscillating charge carrier. And is the Moon involved in any of this? Uh, the Moon, I think, was probably captured during the actual breakup of the whole system. The uh, the evidence from the petroglyphs, and I'm sure Tony will get onto this, indicates that we weren't aligned in a perfect straight line. And at times the Earth was way off the axis and saw the plasma column in certain perspectives which are quite unique. And hopefully, my hope is that one day we'll be able to piece together, uh, given Tony's um, research, 
exactly how we were moving and what we were seeing uh, in some detail. What was the time scale of up and down? Uh, it's hard to say, but it would have been months, years, who knows. Given the scale of things, the size of the heliosphere and uh, the size, presumably, of Saturn's heliosphere, the, uh, we're talking about centuries almost for the onset and the but this is where I get into problems with Dwyer because Dwyer says no it extended way back through the Carboniferous and <laughs> back into prehistory and this is where maybe we have to turn to plasma physics and find out is it possible to form stable fairly close-knit systems I mean we do see in space these polar uh, ejections with uh, knots of matter dotted along the jet but the distances between them are huge and uh, you know so that's the, the only problem I have with that kind of scenario. I think just a brief one. Um, one or two of us haven't uh, heard about Saturn configuration at all before. Uh, haven't got a rough um, time scale, apart from spinning some of these words, as to what period of history we're actually talking about. Ah, uh, well, we're not talking about any period of history. This is all prehistory. Yeah. yeah, because. Um, uh, Dave Tubbers and Dwight are very uh, adamant that when the first civilizations arose they were, still, they were looking at all of these events over their shoulder as if it had occurred at some time in the remembered past but not in the recorded past and uh, part of the problem they faced of course was having this memory they had no referent in their environment to be able to relate it to and so the stories became more and more distorted the further down in time you come um, the uh, estimate is a kind of ten round figures, 10,000 years ago, something like that. The onset of the last ice ages is a good uh, indication. Yeah, I'd like to uh, just draw this to a close now, can we thank Also, if you want one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.